Good afternoon. I'm Donna MacArthur, and I want to welcome you to this webinar, door to door webinar on healthcare and the homeless, a unique role for nursing. You know, homelessness is a major social issue in the United States, and according to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, their annual homeless assessment report in 2022, there were approximately, and I really think this number is lowballing it, over 582,000 individuals experiencing homelessness in the United States. And there are many factors that contribute to homelessness, including poverty, unemployment, lack of affordable housing, mental illness, and substance use disorder. Homelessness also can be triggered by unexpected life events such as job loss, domestic violence, or medical crisis. And we're gonna be discussing many of these aspects today with an expert panel. I'm just so honored to be able to introduce members of the panel and they're each gonna share a little about their background in relation to caring for homeless populations. I'm gonna begin with Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin Brown. Um, I graduated from Vanderbilt School of Nursing in 2017. I'm a adult gerontology primary care nurse practitioner. Um, I work here in New York City um, as part of a medical practice within a social service organization, um, Janian Medical Care. Um, I've worked here for about five and a half years um, and worked in a variety of settings from street medicine, seeing people experiencing homelessness with outreach teams, um, shelters and transitional settings, and then permanent supportive housing. So along kind of like the range of someone's process through the housing system here in New York. Um, during that time, I've kind of found special interest in training in substance use treatment, um, harm reduction methods, uh, HIV primary care, um, wound care and various other kind of specialties as these things come up for my patients um, and really getting um, to where they are and finding um, people wherever they may be in their health and housing process. Um, so yeah, that I think is my background. Wonderful. Mary. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Mary Lambert. I'm a DNP graduate 2011 from Vanderbilt University School of Nursing. I am retired military after two branches of service, 27 years total. Um, variety of assignments, um, almost all in public health. Um, my specialty, my degree from Vanderbilt School of Nursing is, is in public health systems leadership. Um, I'm currently uh, serving as the interim director for a new office of community health for the city of Chattanooga appointed by Mayor Kelly upon his election a couple, almost two years ago now. And we are in a number of areas related to healthcare um, um, for the homeless. So it's a, a, a very important issue for the city of Chattanooga and one which we're doing quite a bit of work and you'll hear more about that later. Outstanding. Okay, Jessica. It's a, it's a little bit hard to hear you, Jessica. So is this better? That's better. Okay, I apologize for that. So I'm a BUSN graduate also. I got my MSN in 2015 and my DNP in 2017. And I first officially started working in homeless health care in 2016. And that's when I went to the UMC's homeless health services program. And that was my first psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner role. And I worked for about five years uh, in Dr. Cheryl Fleisch's um, homeless health program. And my primary clinical role was as an adult consultation liaison psychiatry provider. And I also got to do a little work on the street psychiatry clinic as well, and look at other aspects of homeless health care, such as hospital utilization. And my current clinical role is in an outpatient psychiatric consultation liaison setting now. 
And it's with a wonderful homeless outreach team that also has a SOAR program. And SOAR stands for SSI, SSDI, Outreach Access and Recovery. Wonderful. Okay, Christian. Hello, I am Christian Cadle. I am a, a 2014 DMP graduate from Vanderbilt. Um, I've been working in um, underserved, medically underserved space since about 2008, um, where I started um, on with the School of Nursing in one of their federally qualified health centers. Can um, you speak up just oh, a little bit more? There oh, you go. Sure. You know what? It might help if I put my microphone down. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. That is much better. So, so how much did you hear? Not not enough? Or? No, we, could, we could hear. We could hear. Oh. Oh. Goodness, that time. So um, uh, started in 2008 with a federally qualified health center um, and then moved on with, um, with the School of Nursing and um, with my mentor, Dr. Bonnie Pylon, who I know Donna knows really well, um, we started a, um, uh, we embedded a um, clinic, uh, primary care clinic into a um, medically underserved area that was providing an organization called Urban Housing Solutions, who had transit transitional care, and that was in 2012, and that really awakened my spirit to uh, wanting to serve people experiencing homelessness. Um, uh, got very active within the Homelessness Coalition in Tennessee, um, and then my background is uh, what I do for a living is create health systems, so I, I really wanted to devote my life to creating health systems that help um, uh, with um uh, removing health disparities and health equity, um, but with a real emphasis on people um, who are uh, what I would call ultra vulnerable and people experiencing homelessness would definitely fit into that category. Um, and so um, currently right now um, we operate, we continue um, with, we started with one clinic at Urban Housing Solutions. We now have two clinics um, embedded within their organization. And then also um, we operate a resiliency hub, which is kind of a new concept, um, which we were having a little bit of conversation and it's a little less healthcare traditional and a little bit more um, with um, meeting the needs um, uh, of food and transportation and um, just really um, everything that kind of revolves around helping a person become more self-sustaining. Excellent. As I told you, uh, we're really going to be um, pleased with the information given by these experts during this webinar. I can't add too much as far as the homeless goes. My background is as a family nurse practitioner, and I've had many roles at Vanderbilt. And it, um, it's very, very dear to my heart to include FMP program director and DNP program director. And now in my pre-tirement, or it's not pre-tirement, it's pre-ferment years, I do volunteer at a homeless women's center a half day a week here in Tucson. And I have learned so much from the women who represent very diverse racial and ethnic groups, as well as diverse gender identities who are coming into the, the clinic with about a 35% uh, increase over the past year to include a large increase in the numbers of, of older women who have been relegated to homelessness. Okay. Now we're gonna to talk today about four areas within the overall theme of addressing issues about homelessness while preventing many of the problems that come with people living on the street. And there are four areas here. These areas are acknowledging mental illness, providing care for people living on the street, developing systems of care, and creating workable policies for communities. We know that mental illnesses, including substance use disorders, can be very impactful for individuals experiencing homelessness. We're going to begin with Jessica. Jessica, how have you seen mental health or mental illness impact homelessness? Thank you for this question, as it really gets to the essence of why mental health services can be such a valuable component of homeless health care. And I'll often get questions about essentially the timeline of psychiatric related symptoms in relation to one's housing status. For instance, the experience of having psychiatric symptoms like delusions, hallucinations, or flashbacks, just to name a few possible examples, can make it extremely difficult to maintain housing in some situations. Therefore, obtaining and maintaining housing can be much more manageable for some individuals 
when their psychiatric symptoms are alleviated. On the other hand, the experience of not having housing might also lead to psychiatric symptoms or conditions. For example, a traumatic event might occur while living outdoors that could potentially lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, or the stress of unstable housing could be a possible precipitating factor for substance use disorder. Then, of course, people could have psychiatric symptoms and diagnoses both before and during the time they do not have housing. And likewise, a component to highlight about psychiatric providers who work in homeless, homeless health is that they need to be prepared to see all different types of psychiatric presentations, such as depressive, anxiety, bipolar, and personality disorders, just like any other general psychiatry practice. So I mentioned a little bit earlier that I initially, when I started my homeless health work as a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner, I was working primarily inpatient in a homeless psychiatric consultation liaison psychiatry service. And so all the patients that I was seeing were either physically in the medical hospital or in the emergency department experiencing homelessness and then also having psychiatric conditions. So getting to see a wide array of different diagnoses and that is still the case with the work I'm doing now as well. Mm -hmm. That's very informative. Any input from our other uh, presenters? Yes, this topic. I think you, um, Jessica, you work at uh, Vanderbilt right now and a question that was submitted by one of the, the participants, that it had to do with um, how do you, how could you spread the word at uh, Vanderbilt University Medical Center to engage staff nurses, um, staff nurses in activities? And also another question that dovetails into that is, how can alumni who are in service for the homeless um, share effective ways to minister? Do you have any ideas about this? Or any of the other panelists as well? Yeah, those are, that's a great question. So I actually started, so I've been at Vanderbilt University Medical Center now for many years, and I started before I was a nurse practitioner. I worked as a registered nurse for about five years in the inpatient and emergency department settings. And so I, although my, I said my career officially started in homeless health care in 2016, I mean, really, no matter where you go, you're going to work with individuals experiencing homelessness. So I would even say it started back then as well, although I was not solely um, working with patients uh, for that particular population. And one of the things that was really neat, and this is, you know, before I had any homeless health care experience and even knew that this position could um, come up with Dr. Cheryl Fleisch's team, is that I my leadership at the time set up experiences for us to go to local homeless outreach agencies to volunteer as a group of nurses you know, working together. And it was just a fantastic experience to be able to go to some, we went to a couple different local agencies to do things like foot care and also things like facilitating group sessions. And that was very helpful and you get to be with your peers and it was just a wonderful experience. And so when this position came up later um, for my first nurse practitioner job, I'd had those experiences as well. And I really thought that that uh, would be a position that I would really like and enjoy. And um, then I just spent those next five years working pretty much full time clinically, learning more about homeless health care. I was really lucky to train under Dr. Fleisch because she's a psychiatrist who has expertise in homeless health care and had already started multiple street psychiatry clinics and had gotten the homeless consult service up and running. So um, learning from your peers and your different experiences just can be really, really helpful. Great. Any other comments from the panelists? I would add, so Christian, again, um, and that is an excellent question on how to engage. And so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of a kind of answer it in two ways. The first is um, we've had some success with um, going into um, very vulnerable populations with vaccine um, access 
And one of the things I learned um, working with that program in one of the populations that we would go to is providing vaccines into communities um, where the communities are. And so if you're talking affordable housing, you're talking about going to an apartment complex. If you're talking about people experiencing homelessness, you're going, you're going to missions, you're going onto the street um, and, and, you know, walking onto campsites and being there for them. Um, and so I think that that opened my eyes to the, Mm -hmm. um, kind of open my eyes to what um, I think folks like Jessica and Caitlin have already experienced and going out and there's a lot that we can do in actually bringing medicine and bringing psychiatry and bringing these resources to folks. And then to address the, you know, how can somebody um, contribute where they're at as an alumni, as a healthcare provider, as a person that's just interested. And I'm going to steal from my pastor and just say that, you know, you've got the three T's, you got time, talent, or treasure. Um, you know, if you got time to go and you want to go do something, um, you know, there is, I would look, um, I, for, for, I live in Nashville, so I would look put in homelessness in Nashville. And then the first thing that's going to pop up is the Homelessness Commission. You do Chattanooga, first name that's going to pop up is Dr. Lambert up there. And, and you know, and folks can, can, you can get connected. And if you have time, um, you know, your talents as a healthcare provider, I mean, even if you're not going in in your role as a um, as an advanced nurse practitioner or going in as whatever, you're going to go in as a nurse because you carry that with you wherever you go. And if you're not a nurse, if you're a social worker, you're bringing social work. And so you don't, you can bring that expertise and that understanding and then treasure. I mean, I hate to say it, but, you know, we've got a resiliency center that is always in need of soap, is always in need of band-aids, is always in need of, um, you know, of, um, you know, having the funds to buy bus passes to get people places. And so I think those are just all great ways that you can kind of, um, you know, dip your toe into. Um, I will, if you're in the Nashville area, we do have the Urban Housing Resiliency Center, and I will put my name in the chat for everybody, my email in the chat, if you're interested in volunteering um, for that, we do offer that resiliency center. If you just want to come in and just chill out and relax, that's the other thing too. So much of healthcare is rush, rush, rush. I think with dealing with populations, you you can't, you just can't rush it, and you just got to take some a little bit of time and build that relationship. And so, um, you know that, um, you know, if that's just you know one day a month, that's great. If it's you know if you just fall in love with it, like we have on this panel, then you can you can let that grow in yourself. Right. Excellent points, Christian. And I want to give a plug for the alumni board. We have just established a National Day of Service Committee, and it's going to be, um, we are planning something for early summer or fall, um, or late summer or early fall. More information is going to come out in the summer, but the committee could be asked to consider where to post resources for volunteers. I think this is a really good initiative and that's another way that we can help reach a broader population. Good. Okay. Donna, if I, oops, sure. Donna, if I can echo uh, just a couple of the things that um, Christian mentioned uh, in the city of Chattanooga for folks who are in and around the city, alumni who are in and around the city of Chattanooga, there is a um, homeless, um, healthcare clinic. They're always looking for volunteers. And even if one is not a healthcare worker, there are always volunteer, uh, there's always volunteer work that needs to be done. Um, I would also say wherever you are, um, communities of faith, uh, we find more help from communities of faith who, um, who want to share time, talent, um, et cetera, uh, to the to homeless. They get so, there's so much um, media attention to the mm -hmm. issue. Um, we are left with many people, alumni or not, who just want to know what they can do. Um, and it's helpful if they seek out those uh, established nonprofit, et cetera, um, organizations that are doing things that, that, are, that are really meeting some needs, uh, as opposed to trying to come up with it on their own as individuals. But, um, but for Chattanooga area, there's a, a very large established home healthcare, um, homeless, homeless healthcare clinic. Um, and I actually, um, part of the orientation for the registered nurse navigators in our city's Office of Community Health, part of the orientation is with that clinic, that homeless health clinic. Excellent. What's excellent resources here. Thank you. Now, we're going to go on. 
to um, one of the next areas addressing homelessness. Caitlin, I'd like you to speak to some of the work you're doing and getting care to people where they are. I mean, how do you help clients live healthier lives when they're living on the street? And just as important, how do you build trust with these individuals? Yes, thank you, Don. That's really good questions. Um, so it's kind of a couple parts into how to get people to live healthier lives or have better health overall. One part is that trust that I'll definitely talk through, but um, a lot of it is what we hear a lot in our field of meeting people where they are, being in their essentially home and community by going to see them on the street or bringing them to an office they're comfortable with or being the, with people that they know and showing that respect to begin with. And also, instead of kind of going with our thought of how we want um, maybe someone's health journey and treatment and plan to go, is instead to listen to what they kind of prioritize and what their priorities are at the moment. So being able to hear that someone's currently not able to think about, you know, taking blood pressure medicine, they're thinking about where their next meal is, or they're, they're not able to process that wound on their leg because they're worried about where they're going to next get clean needles or find their next, um, like, substances to be able to use. And instead of kind of being hurt by that or use it or having that be a barrier, instead just like recognizing that, staying with it, and using different tactics to kind of chip away a little at a time to help with um, getting kind of those two paths to meet. Um, and a lot of that is done through consistency and keeping our word, showing up, being that person that's always there. Um, and that goes into that part of building trust is being someone that they know they can rely on, who's not gonna push them to do anything that they're not comfortable with, recognizing that they've been treated really badly in most cases by the system, by healthcare, both trauma from that or trauma from living on the street. And so just, we leave it very optional. Like in my work, like that a lot of times can get someone to talk to us and to housing much easier than kind of the outreach team that is more forceful or having to talk to someone where we're more this optional help that's there if they want it, we're gonna keep coming back, we're gonna keep being present for them. And then when they decide that they want um, anything from us, um, we'll be there for it. Um, we talk a lot about that the relationship is the work or is the treatment, um, that a lot of visits can seem not medically related at all, but that is the treatment of it, is sitting there with someone hearing their story, hearing what's going on with them that day will lead over time. It can be months or years that it's taken to kind of work with someone, but hope that through that trust and relationship, that'll lead to the better health in the future. Can you think of any scenario, any uh, particularly challenging, um, interaction with, with one of the individuals living on the street that turned out really well, but, but you know, um, was one of the more challenging experiences you've had? I can think of a lot, so it's trying to narrow it down <laughs> to one, one in particular. That's right. Um, um, yeah, there's... That is a tough question. It may not be a very fair one, but... But there's just a, a lot of cases of these just huge success stories of someone that I've been working with for years that some of the starting relationships are someone yelling like, go away, I don't wanna see you, I don't wanna, I don't wanna do any of this. And then looking back now years later, as they are now living in a shelter, they have healing wounds. I have one particular case of someone with um, breast cancer that was living on the street, completely untreated, never would, was like adamant against any chemo radiation, any form of treatment or even coming inside. And then we're now two years in and she's inside in a shelter. She's had chemo and radiation and just never thought that we would like get to this day. 
Wow, that's amazing. That is amazing. What do you do? I mean, your days have to be challenging and it does take a lot of energy, not just physical energy, but a lot of, of emotional energy. What do you do um, for you that helps you in managing? I think the team is a big part of it, being able to have coworkers going through the same um, kind of day-to-day -day work. And we do a good job of reaching out to each other to debrief and process every tough visit and situation right. and knowing we're not like alone through it. And then trying to remember like the good moments and the positive things that have come out, like even if they're very small seeming um, to kind of, get you going. And then another big part that's helped is going to conferences and trainings in a similar way to have even a larger team. Um, so I'll kind of plug, I mean, I, there's the International Street Medicine Symposium um, mm. that gets together everyone across the U.S. and some international teams that do street medicine. Um, the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council has conferences. And you end up just meeting a lot of people doing similar things and it kind of brings your like purpose back um, to what you're doing. Wonderful. Right, thank you for what you're doing. I had a, I had a question yes. for, uh, just you had mentioned in your intro, Caitlin, about the harm reduction um, component of your job. And I think that's a big, if you're not used to that concept, I know when I first came in, to working with um, people that were exceedingly vulnerable and not pre in a pre-contemplation to even wanting to engage with anyone or the system. Um, can you give some examples or just like a story of harm reduction and like for maybe for folks that haven't experienced that? Could you define yeah. that for our audience? Yeah. And what do you mean by harm reduction? Um, harm reduction is a model of care and also kind of how we're describing visits is a way of rather than an all or nothing kind of view of people with their risks or behavior or medical treatment. It's that instead focusing on slight reductions to reduce the harm um, and allowing that to be the goal rather than complete removal of whatever harm kind of is there. So there's very like specific cases where it can come up in substance use of treating treating someone and um, you know we do a lot of harm reduction of you know when you use don't use alone we're lucky in New York we have some of the um, supervised consumption sites or having um, having extra needles around is a version of harm reduction we're not saying you can we're not seeing it as you're never going to use heroin again it's we want you to be safe and live through this without the least amount of harm. So we're going to um, provide that. And it's also, yeah, the day-to-day -day of working with someone on the street, um, examples even as like an uncontrolled diabetic that just is not able or ready to have treatment. So you're gonna counsel them on small changes or maybe you take your medicine half the time or maybe you switch what alcohol you're drinking or rather than just saying, you have to make this giant change or nothing. Um, it's meeting in the middle and finding how to make someone safer and healthier in smaller increments. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Oh, it did. It's just, I, I, cause I have it actually, it, it kind of solidified, um, you know, the definition in my mind, because I've been, we've been doing harm reduction. My rules are, if I'm not going to get arrested for it, let's go ahead and try it and just kind of incrementally get people going. And maybe if I'm going to get arrested for a good reason, then I'll, then we'll, we'll, we'll work with somebody. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think those were excellent examples. I would just want I wanted some New York street examples. And so okay. <laughs> maybe Jessica has more from Nashville. Oh, here you go. Headphones in your lap. You got to put the headphones in your lap. Yeah, can't hear you. <laughs> okay. We still can't hear you. So get the, there you go. Sorry about that. There you go. Good. So um, I wanted to echo definitely what Caitlin said, and I can put the Street Medicine Institute information in the chat. And I agree too, I've 
uh, got to go to a couple street medicine symposiums and they're just amazing to get to see people all over doing the same type of work. So I'm adding that to the chat and their motto is go to the people, which is very fitting um, for what we've been talking about today. And also I, I wanted to kind of piggyback to you when thinking about um, also when people, for all the inpatient providers out there, if there are inpatient providers, that is the space I first found myself in when I was working in this area. And when, when individuals who are experiencing homelessness, like Caitlin was, talk, was talk, just talking about, if they're admitted inpatient, they might not have um, you know, been engaging in the system before in the past. And so that is a great opportunity to build rapport and build relationships when people are there. So sometimes if someone, for instance, even if I would see people that had really traumatic things happen or bad burns or something like that, that they had to stay inpatient for an extended period of time. And that's a great time for inpatient providers to build rapport with people um, because they're there and they might not have engaged in the healthcare system ever or in years. And then you have that opportunity with them. Very good point. One of the things I've noticed to, just in um, my volunteer work is sometimes the hospitals will just drop off individuals who have been admitted through the, the ED to our center because they are homeless. And it's just, I mean, we've had individuals dropped off with stage four liver cancer. We've had them dropped off with myriad other issues. Sometimes um, they've been in accidents and they've come in with cast, et cetera, et cetera. And that is certainly, we want to do the best for individuals, but it, it, it's a very complex issue. Um, we certainly don't have any uh, answers here as of yet, but, mm -hmm. but you brought up a really good point about the inpatient piece. Great, thank you. Okay, Christian, on to you. We've been talking about creating systems for delivering care to the homeless. Could you give some examples with your extensive background in this? Mm, extensive. Um, I think extensive background. As is compared like, to most people. As I show up for work. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I think I would categorize that in kind of three areas. Um, the systems that, you know, that, um, that, that I've had a hand in creating, which is kind of in the middle, the systems that are available to us within our local area, and then the systems that are available to us within, um, and it's apt that you mentioned the hospital comment before the hospital, um, just working within BUMC um, and kind of our work. And so um, within the systems that I have um, have had or have control over developing, um, one of the first things that I learned was is that it's it really is and it just goes back and echoes what Caitlin said. It's not about healthcare care to start. You know, it really is. I mean, we um, when we first opened up our first really transitional care, it was I mean, we didn't even touch healthcare issues. It felt like for maybe if we were lucky six months. I mean, it was about food. It was about um, how to do finance. It was about how to pay your rent on time. It was about how to clean an apartment. It was how to do different things. And we would and we would really lean on and found out that we needed to create a system that was very interprofessional because I know us nurses really have a have a broad scope and we can do almost everything um, but we um, we there are things that social worker can do there are things that medicine can do there are things that pharmacy can do um, that can really amplify and really synergize the system when you're when you're um, when you're trying to care for people um, and bring people um, on the healthcare team, and what I'm talking about, that bringing people that are experiencing homelessness to be self empowered to do that. And so the systems we create are very team based. Um, the other thing, creating systems, is once you kind of look at that social determinants of health, then you're going to look at um, the behavioral health. Once you have those social determinants of health, then the kind of the next step for me in those systems as we build is let's work on your behavioral health. Um, backgrounds and what trauma that you've had, you know, what um, things do you bring, um, you know, uh, from your psychological background that are affecting your overall health. Um, and then, and then finally, once we can get to it, then we can start working on, you know, us 
uh, you know, adult providers or FMPs working on their on their um, uh, physical. So it's kind of backwards to the way sort of we prioritize healthcare today in the systems. Is we like I've really tried to prioritize the social determinants of health first mental health second and then physical health third just because to do it the other way around is um is just beating your head against a wall in my in my opinion um you know then the other big component is um working and developing systems that work outside of your um uh, sector so that can be the housing sector that can be the political sector that can be um you know i don't want to talk too much about the policy sector because we've got a policy person and a political person making movements on that area so my area is really in creating those systems but you've got to work within an environment that is outside of you um, that has priorities sometimes good sometimes bad um, and then on the other side working with um, i'm been very ups and down with with the UMC. I love them, um, and but I will say that they're in a big up. Jessica and I were just in a big meeting a couple of weeks ago um, with their emergency department, really strategizing um, not just street medicine and, and um, you know street medicine and providing care on the streets, but really developing a whole kind of homeless health network of um, of systems um, that will um, kind of Donna, what you had said. I mean, it's all too common to have someone come in and it's I, I really don't think it's the hospital wanting to like discharge them to the street there's a lot of factors in there sometimes the person wants really to get out of that hospital and they're going to do whatever they can sometimes it is that you know that the you know the funding ran out or whatever is happening you know it's ne never an ulterior motive i don't think anybody ever just wants to discharge somebody to the bus stop but it happens a lot and so how do we create systems that really um really help um, make that so the that we're kind of, you know, mitigating those things, building that trust with the person, you know, building those systems in place to where when they're able to maybe get out of the hospital sooner, but they're in an area like a respite center home or something like that. So there's a lot of great work that can be done with systems. Um, and, um, but also I want to tell you that I never leave. I'm in a shirt and tie right now, but mostly I wear jeans and t-shirts um, because what I really love is, you know, I, I really believe you can't build a system unless you've been in the environment. And so as much as I can get out and um, see folks, um, it goes back to volunteering, volunteering in your city. There's just lots of um, opportunities to do that. So. Well, that was a little rambling. I felt like I was a little bit more concise in my brain, but it didn't come out that way. Oh, I think you provided a lot of good info oh, here. You. I mean, do you know, one of the questions that um, one of the um, participants asked is, how do we get the information of all the free services to the homeless? And how are they even going to get there where the services are? Does anyone have any input? that. I mean, that, that can... I'll do, since I talked a bunch, and I will say, we have the Bible in Nashville is the little book um, put out by the contributor. And the contributor contributor for those that don't know is a Nashville paper and then they have papers around that really work with an individual to provide, um, you know, uh, the ability to become self-sufficient, provide a lot of empl employment services, but they provide a, a, a excellent book. Every year they compile it and we get asked all the time. They put a lot of work into that. Um, and then the other answer to that question is um, you, you know, you got to get out there. You got to get on the streets yeah. and you got to talk to people. You got, you, you know, this is not work that can be done exclusively in an office. You have to be, you have to meet people, you have to meet providers, you have to make connections. And so um, it's a, the, for me, it's the contributor book and then going out and, you know, making those connections myself. Mm -hmm. I just put where to turn in Nashville in the chat. Great. Great. Thank you. And that is an issue I found. I mean, we have brochures, the, the center where I am, but uh, it depends the health literacy. Can the individuals even read what it is, where the services are? And getting there is a huge problem. And then wanting to take part of that. So you're exactly right. Meeting them where they're at, if when they get to know you and being able to handhold and eventually they may seek out the other services, but having them on site so you don't miss an opportunity 
is the best way to go. Accessing them um, can be very, very challenging at best. Anyway, a question that, that was asked as well, and if your state had expanded Medicaid, do you think it'd make a difference in the trajectory of your patients' lives? That's a tough one. I, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know that there's any one answer, but any thoughts on that? I mean, I'm going to say yes, um, simply because there'll be more access. I will say practically, um, a lot of the individuals that I see in my little sector of North Nashville that I cover, um, they, they do, they're actually covered under Medicaid a lot of times. They've got pre-existing conditions. Um, a lot of times it's, you know, unfortunately, sometimes it's easier to get somebody in Nashville experiencing homelessness health care than it is to actually get um, once they get more, the problem is, is once they get a little bit more secure and self-sufficient, then a lot of the services become, get ripped away. Right. And so it's actually a barrier upstream than it is, uh, or downstream than it is upstream. Mm -hmm. Good point. I will, sorry. <laughs> Jessica. I would also agree with Christian and say yes. So the the program I mentioned earlier, the solar program, in most states, if people obtain SSI or SSDI, they can also get access to Medicaid or Medicare. And so I have seen a lot of individuals through that program also obtain health insurance, and it's just made a huge difference as well. And I've also luckily had the opportunity to do different site visits for locations where Medicaid has been expanded in those states and being able to see their homeless health programming with the expansion of Medicaid and getting to see extra things they get to do has been really neat as well. Great, thank you. Caitlin, were you gonna say something? Yeah, about well? in similar lines, just in comparison to give the New York perspective that it is just so unbelievably lucky that every single patient we see has Medicaid unless they are completely undocumented. So we never kind of have to have this worry of where can we send them? Where can they go? Who can they see outside of us? Like, even though we don't worry about their insurance, the ability to refer to other places is really just a huge difference. Thank you. Okay, Mary, you. Mary has extensive career, and I've had the pleasure of working with her in her DNP program. And I will tell you, she's had extensive career in multiple things, but to include policymaking on the federal and state level, and now, as she mentioned, for the city of Chattanooga. Question, Mary, is what are some ways leaders can provide support for people on the street while supporting the harmony and safety goals of the general population? Well, uh, thank you, Donna. That was, uh, thank you for that generous um, uh, introduction and and one of my favorite faculty and most helpful. And um, so very grateful to what I um, uh, gained through my association with you, especially as a student, as a DNP student. Um, to my- it made me look good, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but to my, to my panel colleagues, um, I will have to say that everything that you've all said, I need to, I will get this video because there are some folks in the city who are discussing, making decisions on policy, who need to hear everything that you have said. So amen to all of that and thank you very much. And it will be repeated um, in City Hall um, at these policy meetings. But in um, addressing the issue of homelessness in Chattanooga, you know, as in every other city, um, we have to look at resources. Um, what do we have? What can we afford? Uh, we're in a tough budget cycle right now. This is our budget, our budget year ends. Um, shortly. So we're, we're, we're in the throes of trying to figure out what gets funded at what level, et cetera, that kind of thing, including homelessness. Um, the um, access uh, for our healthcare services for um, homeless populations, um, how, do, how can they access it? Um, what partners do we have in the city who can assist us with uh, providing healthcare services? Well, I mentioned the um, homeless healthcare clinic that we have in Chattanooga. And I will say that it's very interesting that um, the, the fastest growing, uh, when our population of homeless individuals was growing the fastest, 
grew around that homeless healthcare clinic because there were some other services there. There was also a police precinct there. There is also a police precinct there. So we've gotten the police involved in, um, in uh, managing issues around safety, that kind of thing. Not so much as enforcers, but as, in, as protectors. We wanted to make sure that the, the individuals felt safe. Um, communications, um, it's been very helpful to have such media coverage of the, the growth, initially the, the, the large growth in homeless uh, populations uh, in Chattanooga, especially uh, towards the, uh, the peak of the pandemic. Um, and then we recently, uh, yesterday, we had a, a wonderful press conference um, announcing the, you know, what some of our results have been with some of the policy decisions that have been made in Chattanooga with a 40% reduction in the number of homeless individuals in Chattanooga. That still need, leaves a lot of folks, but when you go up by 200% and you come down by 40%, that's still some progress. Wow. The challenge in policymaking, one of them is that, yes, we are making progress, but we still have individuals who are homeless, they who will need services, healthcare services and other services um, while they are still homeless. So it's, it's that primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention kind of thing, where we still got to treat and manage and serve the individuals when they're homeless. But I do notice a, a, um, um, a, ch a challenge for all of us uh, in policymaking with deciding on where those resources go. We do need resources to go towards um, eliminating homelessness. Um, our goal, and we do believe it's a lofty one, is to end homelessness, end it. But until that day, we still have to have resources, et cetera, programs to address the, especially the healthcare needs um, of homeless individuals. There is a need um, to help us with the policymaking in networking with other communities, other cities. I know I've gotten some information from the National League of Cities uh, regarding some of the uh, programs that they have in place. So we're benchmarking with other cities, other programs. I've picked up some pieces from this webinar that I will be sharing some websites with some consultants that we're bringing in. The city of Chattanooga uh, policy decision was to create a, an office of homelessness and supportive housing. Um, so there's a lot of work being done in that in that office, um, including outreach services, community partnerships, um, helping to support those. Uh, we also have had um, ARP money, American Rescue Plan monies that we were that were given to the city that we we were then able to uh, sub uh, award to uh, organizations throughout the city to assist with, uh, among other things, some homeless, um, homeless population needs. Um, the networking is really helpful. Um, the nonprofit organizations in the community are amazing. I, I, I really don't know that I've noticed or paid attention to you know, how, many home, how many nonprofits there are in other cities I've lived in. Chattanooga has a, has a wealth of them. Uh, large, small, all sizes, and they do all kinds of great work. The faith community partners. Uh, we are partners with um, the faith communities, all faiths, um, and they have been tremendous. So we've even seen partnerships between um, Protestant congregations, Jewish congregations, um, one Protestant church, which is near near a, um, um, a synagogue. The, the Protestant congregation provides a hot, hot meal one hot meal every day. And the Jewish um, um, and a Presbyterian church provide some, um, some housing in addition to some other, some overnight housing in addition to some other organizations in the city. So the partnerships are just amazing, um, all with a you know, heart to serve and a need to serve and what can I do, what can I do? And, and it's wonderful that we were able to, um, to funnel people who want to know what they can do when they see a news report about a family or individual who are living on the streets or in these camps, uh, that we can funnel them to these nonprofit organizations. Uh, the Office of Community Health um, does have a resource manual that we've developed. Uh, most of the work was done by our registered nurse navigators um, that we can use. And it's like our, our Bible or our directory <laughs> um, that we, we use on a daily basis to um, get individuals to the services that they need. Um, but there is a, there is a, a need to really look at how we can end homelessness, that we have the kind of affordable housing in place and that people have the mental health care services um, and other health services that they need 
uh, so that they can, so that they are pulled up from that homeless situation and they're healthy. Um, I think, you know, uh, nurses are, are such a unique role. Uh, nurses and all healthcare professionals, I believe, are in such a unique role to influence policy, uh, to inform, because there are many people that are doing a lot of work um, trying to decide, you know, make, make the right decisions or the best decisions. And I think they need our input into what's needed, what's going to work in that setting, what's not going to work in that setting, uh, where the resources might be best spent when there are limited resources, as there usually are. Nobody has a blank check. Um, and that said, um, uh, you know we're you know we're in the business of creating workable policies. Um, our Office of Homelessness and Supportive Services, as um, Office of Homelessness and Supportive Housing, as well as a new office that was created by Mayor Kelly. The, we have a a chief housing officer who has been into the um, you know identifying resources that we can use for pilot programs um, related to more sustainable housing for homeless individuals um, that partners with some of the nonprofits and some of the partners in our faith community. So lots of moving parts in there, but there's so many partial answers to this problem. I think, you know, I think we're, we're making progress and we'll continue to make progress because we're putting those pieces together um, and listening to our community. Uh, we often have uh, homeless individuals and uh, we often have homeless individuals coming to our county commission and uh, into our uh, city council meeting because everybody gets to, um, you know, speak for three, three minutes or so. Um, and they, and some of them are quite articulate. We also have some very um, influential healthcare professionals, nurses and um, physicians, one, one trauma surgeon who has spoken. It came straight from surgery in the lab coat, quite, quite impactful to that city council <laughs> that day. Chattanooga is a little different from Nashville, folks, because we do have, uh, we do not have the metropolitan government. We have a city mayor, a county mayor, a city council, and a county commission. <laughs> so um, we, and we do work in partnership with them. Um, the Office of Community Health has a, uh, M a signed MOU contract partnership with the county health department. Um, so that we work hand in glove um, on many of the issues around and the needs around uh, homeless populations in our city and county. Um, but it's a, it's a work that, you know, gives us a lot of, yesterday was a, a, a nice reward for us to have a press conference about our 40% reduction. Some of the programs we're putting in place, some new construction for affordable housing, that kind of thing, all in the presence of media and the assistant secretary for um, for housing <laughs> from the uh, Biden administration. So it was, uh, that was kind of a reward for all the work we've done in the last two years, almost two years that Mayor Kelly has been in office. Wow. Um, I hope that's helpful and I didn't ramble too much, um, but we're pretty excited. Helpful. What do you say to, let's say a new nurse or, or a new advanced practice nurse who says, well, you know, I know policy is important, but I just am not into the policy piece. I, it's very intimidating. But do, do you have any, just a, a few snippets of, of advice that you would share? Would love to. I love the question. I really love the question. I'm a, so, I didn't mention in my intro that I'm an associate professor at Vanderbilt um, with the DNP program, uh, teaching primarily with the DNP program. And um, one of my first comments is that all policy is health policy. Um, and you are the expertise that policymakers need to hear from. Now, that may be a letter, that may be an email, that may be three minutes worth of comment on an issue related to homeless populations at a city council meeting or a county commission meeting. Um, that may be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a, uh, with a councilman, a councilwoman, or with a commissioner, a county commissioner. Um, you know it. They probably don't. We do have some healthcare professionals that are involved in some politically appointed and even one elected position, but we're the experts. And nurses, we are. Uh, the nurses uh, are, nurses are the most trusted profession. Mm -hmm. um, this sounds like the first few minutes of my introductory lecture to health policy. That was one of the oh. courses I was involved okay. with. You, you, we, have to, we have to be in the conversation. And it doesn't mean that we're in the thick of it, but that means that we do um, a steady um, feed of 
what we know from our frontline experience in healthcare for this population and for others. Great. Thank you. Okay. We have one last question before we close. I think this is an important one. And I think that through your responses thus far, I mean, you have really expressed how your background makes you uniquely qualified with the type of work you're doing and how rewarding it is. But specifically, how do you think in general, having a nursing background uniquely fits you for this type of work that you're doing and how is it rewarding? I missed the question. I'm sorry. I was reading. There's been uh, two questions in the uh, uh, in the chat. Okay. Um, that Go I think, Let's do those. Yeah. Okay. yeah I, that, that I think are. So a couple of my answered just in chat, but we can go. But there's two that are coming with pediatric homeless patients. Um, I, I have not, my work has been like in, in encampments, um, it, which is only kind of a one subset and I don't experience them all that often. Um, but I do know we, that the in Nashville, there is a substantial amount of children that are, would be, would qualify as chronically homeless. There's, they're living in vehicles, they're couch surfing. So I'd be interested to hearing what some of the in the street professionals have to say about that and a policy level for Mary as well. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, I think that that, question, that's so. much more important than than the, the question that I posed. So any input on that or experience you've had with the pediatric population? Uh, I haven't personally, since we don't see pediatrics, but that's also because of the way it's structured within um, the city is there are, specific pathways for families to go to family shelter and faster housing for placement if there are children um, and that where they get placed they are trying out different settings of having medical care on site for uh, the kids and families. Mm -hmm. Good point. And I, and I would you know reflect the same kind of thing that Caitlin just mentioned. Um, we do have um, nonprofits again, wonderful nonprofits who have um, programs for families with children. Um, and if the healthcare isn't on site, then there's um, direct access referral to known providers who can provide services needed by the families and children. Uh, but some wonderful, there are two of them, nonprofits in the Chattanooga area that, um, that spe quote, specialize in families with children. Okay. And then I, I mean, I would say I put in another answer was, is that we, I would completely agree with Caitlin um, that children, um, it's an unfortunate situation because children and particularly women who are in domestic violence or people in domestic violence situations, I don't want to be, um, uh, say it that way, but um, they get the highest priority. And unfortunately, I think one of the biggest barriers is the child protective services, the fear of that if they're exposed, that they're in this situation, that they're going to be in jeopardy of losing their, you know, family or connections with their family. I've heard that quite often, um, but from what I am, you know, um, um, you know, from my experience, that has not been the case in any, I've never known one person that where it had been a situation for, for a pediatric uh patient or a pediatric person to uh, uh, to be separated. I think that most policy is in place to really keep families together. I don't know. So, um, I mean, that would be mine. We, we, we also have a um, significant amount of resources for children experiencing homelessness and then, um, and then families as well. Mm -hmm. Good point. Any other comments from that? I know something that we have seen that can be very challenging is women who present who are pregnant and um, occasionally have had no prenatal care. And we do have some resources within the community, an excellent community health center we can refer to, but it does, um, that can pose uh, a sense of emergency in our, as well as getting them into services and then to think, what's gonna to happen to the child. And I, I don't know um, the follow-up 
on most of these, which is which is unfortunate. Any other comments? This has been quite Thank you. an amazing panel. And I think this will be an excellent recording to share with uh, student groups as well as alumni to provide this, this insight in looking at so many of the important components uh, that haven't really been addressed as far as with homelessness and the expertise we have. Certainly you brought out some of the critical roles that nursing can play to address the issues regarding homelessness. So I wanna thank each of you. Do you have any other remarks to, to share with, with our audience right now in closing about why they may want to get involved in any way they can using their talents, treasures, and what did your pastor say, Christian? Uh, talent, time, and treasure. Time. Okay. Time I may have just addressed the elephant in the room with the time part. Okay. <laughs> um, any closing remarks on that? You know, if I could go first and just briefly, just briefly say that the, the policy pieces that are in place right now in every city, I am sure, uh, are so important. They need to, we, re, we need to continue to inform, um, to um, inform those who are making those decisions, who are having those discussions regarding what's needed. And then for those of us who have the time, the talent, and Christian, I've forgotten the third one again. <laughs> the time, the talent. Um, Tre treasure. The treasure. Don't forget the treasure. <laughs> Let me treasure. put my Amazon wish and list the on here for Thank the you. clinic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To, to, you know, to, if you've got time to contribute, I mean, there is, there is such a need, um, you know, you know, our goal is to end homeless, uh, homelessness, but there is such a need. So those who, you know, have the time to volunteer um, and contribute very much needed. Great. Thank you. Any other closing comments? Just gonna say how much I'm um, working in homeless healthcare, and I, you know, I just can't imagine doing anything else now. I don't, you know, when I got into it, that was my, I didn't know if it would be the right fit, and I just loved every minute of it. And like everyone's talked about, you know, just, um, you know, working with this population can be so very rewarding, and you know, spending more time on psychosocial history and you know, getting to know people in order to get to, get to, you know, more of the diagnostics and the treatment, other parts like Christian was talking about. And so it really is such a wonderful subspecialty that could be anyone's subspecialty in nursing. And um, so I'm grateful for that. And I'm also grateful now to get to talk to students about it and other people mm -hmm. who are interested. So um, thank you for this opportunity today. And I am also always happy to answer questions or talk further. Great. Caitlin. Yes, thanks so much for, for putting this together. I think this is such a huge part of being the providers or nurses that we are, is learning to work with um, people going through like the worst, the worst of it. And it, it does make you better at what you do more of an understanding and like um, effective provider. Um, and that just, I really love working with our patients and didn't know that this was something that was available for us to specialize in. And I encourage anyone that's interested in it to look into that even partially um, and possibly joining us. Thank you. Thanks to each of you, amazing input. And thank you for giving those who are experiencing homelessness a voice and you're doing that and I think that's very very important thank you very much and thanks to all of those who've attended as well um, I think this has been very insightful <laughs>